thermal electric materials basically convert thermal energy into electrical energy. And then you also have materials that are able to store energy, think materials that are used in batteries, right? So a lot of what we do, materials, a lot of what material scientists and engineers do are really vital for technological innovation and the, the improvement of society, all right? So I, I imagine um, most of you are, are familiar with the Game of Thrones. Um, what was very, I guess, um, critical to the, the theme of that, that show was um, Valyrian steel, right? Valyrian steel weapons had this mystical quality to them. They were one of the very few weapons that could be, could be used against the White Walkers, right? So if you take a look at Ned Stark's uh, Valyrian steel sword, you can see that the sword was basically a, a Damascus, what we call a Damascus steel. It has this marbled appearance because it is actually a composite material. It is made out of alternating layers of very uh, low carbon soft steel and high carbon, very hard durable, uh, very hard steel that is able to retain a very, very fine edge. So this Damascus steel is, is created by taking two different types of steel and then forging them together, folding them, forging them together, folding and forging them together so that you create basically a steel with lots of very distinct layers um, of, of the different types of steel within them. So we can replicate this process by putting together stacks of different types of steels and then forge welding them together. So depending on how we arrange those, those stacks of mild steel and high carbon steel or the low carbon steel and high carbon steel, we can forge weld them together and create very, very intricate patterns when we etch the, uh, uh, the steel blade. So that's how we create um, these these, these types of very hard, um, very long lasting and durable uh, steel blades. So this type of technology has been around for, for literally thousands of years. This is often how we can, uh, this, this understanding of the material science aspects can be used to basically date um, things like samurai swords. So depending on the area, by in, during which you know, the samurai swords were created, we can analyze the, the steel, the types of steels that are used and be able to date them. So a thousand years ago, swordsmiths back in, you know, in Japan were, were using this technique uh, and creating these, these composite samurai swords by taking very hard steel and blending it with medium carbon, or low carbon steel, which was much softer. You want the very, very hard steel at the cutting edges because it's able to retain a very <clears throat> sharp cutting edge. And then you want the, the softer, more ductile steel along the core of the blade that allows it to flex without uh, a fracturing. If you just made a, a sword or blade out of uh, a very, very hard steel, when it hits some, when the blade hits something hard, the blade would just shatter. But by putting in this softer steel or a medium carbon steel as the core, and just using the very very hard steel at the cutting edge, you can retain the very very sharp um, uh, attributes of the blade while allowing the blade to flex and accommodate um, deformation without fracturing. So 1,200 years ago, they were using this this understanding of materials uh, to create and engineer these uh, very valuable uh, uh, blades. So if you recall back in the, the, the show, the Game of Thrones, um, they took Ned Stark's sword, they melted it down, and then they reforged two swords from that very large sword. That's actually not how it works if this were Damascus steel, right? So Damascus steel is basically two types of steel that are bonded in the solid state. If you melt it down, you're no longer creating this, this uh, uh, composite structure anymore. It would be analogous to taking like one scoop of 
you know, vanilla ice cream, one scoop of chocolate ice cream, and then allowing those scoops of ice cream to melt together and then trying to separate them out. It, it would not, that would not be possible. You can only create these Damascus steel type structures in the solid state. You cannot uh, create these types of structures uh, directly from the liquid state. So understanding some of the, the principles behind you know, how they, they manufacture, how they create these, um, these, these weapons is all based on material science and engineering. So as I said, you know, materials are, are constantly evolving. So probably the most prolific inventor uh, in the United States that we know of it was Thomas Edison, right? So his most famous invention was the incandescent light bulb. So when he was going about trying to, I guess, uh, um, realize this invention for this uh, incandescent light bulb, he came up with this expression, genius is 1% inspiration. So he had an idea and then 99% perspiration which means that he had to basically try to create this invention through a sequence of trial and error. He had to try lots and lots of different things and be able to uh, um, realize this invention. So when he had this idea for this light bulb, back in his day, when he you know, invented the light bulb, they really did not have very many engineering materials. He basically had a, a workshop or a lab where he had all the engineering materials that were available to him at that time. And at that time, there were really only about a hundred or so engineering materials available to him. So if you look back and, and, um, uh, and read his biography, you, you'll realize that the first material that he was able to use as the filament in his incandescent light bulb was basically cotton fibers that were impregnated with carbon black or, or graphite. So that was the first material that he used that, that demonstrated that, this, that, that his concept of this incandescent light bulb was able to, to, to become realized. Now later, after they demonstrated this, they, they found better materials. Most of the incandescent light bulbs that you can find nowadays, they're made out of uh, a, a high temperature tungsten metal. Um, as the, the filament. So back during Thomas Edison's day, which is about you know 100 some odd years ago, there were only a few hundred materials available to him to, or to all engineers in general. Nowadays, polymers have really become popular uh, for use, not just in food packaging or textiles, they're using polymeric materials in all sorts of applications. Nowadays, there are over 45 different, 45,000 different types of polymeric materials. Um, back in Thomas Edison's day, aluminum was a very rare element because they did not have the technology to extract the aluminum metal from aluminum ores. So now we have, you know, aluminum alloys are plentiful, magnesium alloys are plentiful, titanium alloys are plentiful. We have thousands of different types of, you know, these, these light metal alloys that we, we can use. Back in his day, we did not have any carbon fiber composite, glass fiber composite. Um, composites are engineered materials. So now, depending on our specific design requirements, we can select from hundreds or, or even thousands of different grades of composite materials. So today there are, in excess of 160,000 distinct types of engineering materials. And these engineering materials were inspired by um, innovations that required these materials enabled to operate. So what material scientists typically do is we, we understand the different attributes of the different materials and help guide the, the, the engineer um, when he's coming up with this design in terms of selecting the, met, the best material for that specific function. So that's what material scientists and engineers do. So the, the most famous uh, uh, or the most, uh, uh, I guess, acclaimed uh, material scientist that I know of is Dr. Myron McLean. 
Dr. Myron McLean was a government scientist who created admantium metal. So admantium metal is what Captain America's shield is made out of. Admantium metal is also what was used to uh, um, go into Wolverine's claws. Um, admantium was used for Ultron's armor. So what is admantium? Admantium was created from some stolen uh, vibranium from Wakanda, and he mixed that uh, vibranium with some steel to create this synthetic uh, material, admantium, that was basically unbreakable, unbendable, indestructible, right? So without, you know, Dr. Myron McLean, there would not be a Captain America shield. Without Captain America shield, would there be Captain America? I don't know. So materials enable, I guess, innovation. Without these types of materials, we would not have these types of um, uh, innovations. So if you look at you know, some of the, the, the greatest uh, engineering achievements in the past you know, century, um, you'll see that aerospace um, is basically the third greatest engineering achievement. The first is electrification, the second is computers, the third is aerospace. So a hundred years ago, if you know, I wanted to travel to some place like Australia, right? How would I get there? I would basically need to take a train to, to one of the coasts, either New York or Los Angeles, hop on a boat, and that boat would take literally months to sail to Australia. And there'd probably be a 50% chance that I would not survive that trip. So now if there were you know, no COVID around, I did not have to take any of these you know, PCR tests before traveling, I could just you know, hop on an Uber, go to O'Hare, and I could be in Melbourne or Sydney in about 20 hours. So aerospace innovation, air, the development of aerospace technologies has really uh, resulted in globalization of society. I can basically be anywhere within 24 hours, or I can get stuff delivered to me from anywhere in the world from in about 24 hours. So if I want, you know, my colleague in uh, Australia or New Zealand wants to ship me a, a sample to examine in one of my microscopes, he can put a package uh, send a package to FedEx and FedEx will get it to my door in, in the span of, of 24 hours. So aerospace technologies has really contributed to, to making the world a very, very small place that allows for uh, um, uh, uh, collaboration and, and globalization. So one of the questions that I always ask some of my students is, you know, do we really understand what engineers do, how engineers contribute to the development of something like an aircraft. Well, we all know what aerospace engineers do, right? And we all know what mechanical engineers do. So aerospace engineers, they focus on the control systems, the navigation systems. Um, they do the fluid dynamics, aerodynamics, contribute somewhat to the structural design. Mechanical engineers are largely responsible for structural design, solid mechanics, heat transfer, manufacturing, right? But what do the material scientists do? How do they contribute to the development of you know, uh, um, an aircraft? Well, materials engineers, they help identify the materials and processes that are used in the manufacture of one of these aircraft. They also uh, help with life prediction. They predict how long the plane will last, how long structures um, can, be, uh, can operate in a reliable manner. They also assist with you know, manufacturing, failure analysis, and sustainability issues when it comes to uh, the design and manufacture of, of aircraft. So if we just take the, the aircraft back in the day, right? So when the Bright brothers first flew at, at Kitty Hawk, right? The materials that they had available to them were very, very limited. The materials that they used in their initial you know, Wright Hawk flyer um, was basically wood and fabric. Wood and fabric was used to, to make planes 
through World War I. So a lot of the planes that were, were built and, and used in World War I, a lot of them were basically wood frame structures where they, they wrapped some fabric around it. And that was, that was it because that was the, the, the material that was available to them at that time. It wasn't until about the 1920s that they started going away from wood and fabric. And then they started using metal for the, the body and the structure of these planes. So in the 1920s, they started making some planes out of steel sheet, very heavy. They didn't fly very fast, right? It wasn't until about the, the 1940s that they were able to come up with a, a suitable process for making aluminum. And they use aluminum to create not only the frame, but also the, the fuselage uh, um, of these planes. So we still use aluminum on a lot of our commercial planes now. So the next time you're, you're boarding a plane, you can look at the surface. If you see a surface where you see panels and rivets, you know that that plane is made out of aluminum. But recent developments have uh, pushed towards the emerging use of advanced composites in these aircraft. So starting with the Boeing 787, um, transitioning to the Airbus A350 and some of the, uh, um, we're starting to use more and more composite materials in these aircraft. So these newer composite planes, because they're manufactured out of carbon fiber composite, basically the same material that you, you have in your tennis rackets or your, your golf club shafts or your fishing rods, they manufacture these carbon fiber composite parts as these very, very large uh, cylinders. They basically take carbon fiber, they wrap it around a giant mandrel, they impregnate it with epoxy, they allow it to cure, and then they bolt these sections together. So instead of you know riveting together thousands of these aluminum panels, they create these very large planes in three sections, and then they just bolt these sections together um, to create a, a passenger jet, right? So if we look at you know, some of the, the technologies or some of the materials that were, were used for, for aircraft, one of the most technologically advanced aircraft, even today, was the SR-71 Blackbird. So this was a spy plane that was first uh, um, a commission back in the 1960s. So well before they had, you know, supercomputers, um, this plane was basically designed by engineers using slide rules, pencil and paper, um, et cetera. So this SR-71 Blackbird, I think still has the, the, the record as being the fastest aircraft that we were able to produce. And this was designed back in the 1960s. So, Technically, the top speed of this aircraft was classified. This was a spy plane that flew at extremely high altitudes. Typical commercial jets fly at about 35,000 feet. The SR-71 Blackbird flew at about 80,000 feet, so much, much higher. Um, the pilots actually had to wear uh, uh, an oxygen suit because there's no oxygen at those, those altitudes. And it flew at that altitude and flew very, very fast because they didn't want people to be able to shoot it down. So technically the top speed of this aircraft was classified, but based on what we know of the material. So because it flew so fast, there was a lot of frictional heating associated with you know, any object that travels at that velocity. So because it was traveling at speeds, you know, at, at supersonic speeds, Mach, to Mach 3, Mach 4, there was a lot of frictional heating. So instead of making the fuselage out of composite or aluminum, which do not have much temperature capability, they had to make this SR-71 Blackbird out of titanium. So this is a titanium skin fuselage. So we, what we, based on what we know of titanium, titanium can only handle uh, being operated at temperatures about 600, 700 degrees centigrade. 
we know that the top speed of the SR-71 Blackbird was about Mach 4.5 or 4.5 times the speed of sound. If we had better materials that could be used as the fuselage for these types of structures, the SR-71 could probably fly faster. So the, the top speed was basically limited by the material that was used in the fuselage of this aircraft. So nowadays, there is significant interest in trying to um, develop these hypersonic aircraft. So aircraft that can travel at 10 to 20 times the speed of sound. Now, the challenge there is, again, related to the material. What material are you going to use for the fuselage? Because it gets super duper hot um, at the trailing or the, at the leading edges of the aircraft. So if we're traveling at, let's say, you know, a, a Mach number of six, the leading edge temperatures are in the vicinity of about 2000 degrees Fahrenheit, which is extremely, extremely hot. Not too many materials can sustain those types of temperatures. So what's really limiting our ability to, to realize these hypersonic vehicles is basically the materials that we can use for the, 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 the fuselage of the aircraft. So I, I, I guess I gave the example of, you know, flying from um, here to, to Australia, right? So I, I, to go to Australia from Chicago, I probably need to catch a flight from Chicago to LA, um, which is about a four hour flight. And then the flight from LA to Sydney or Melbourne, which is about 14 hours. So typical commercial jets travel just under uh, um, uh, supersonic speeds, so a Mach about Mach 0 0.85, 0 0.9. So a hypersonic vehicle travels at a Mach number of about 10 to 20, typically cruises about 14. So that 14 hour flight from LA to Sydney or Melbourne now becomes one hour if I were to be able to uh, um, fly in one of these hypersonic vehicles. But what's kind of limiting our ability to realize this, this design is the materials. And there's a lot of interest now in trying to develop these materials with ultra high temperature capabilities get, that can be used for these hypersonic vehicles. Um, another example where materials ha has contributed a great deal is in the automotive arena. So here I have a couple of pictures of, you know, some orange uh, um, pony cars or muscle cars. One is a 1971 Pontiac Firebird. The other is a 2019 Ford Mustang. Now, back in 1971, um, they called these muscle cars because they, all these cars had very, very big engines. This Pontiac Firebird um, was equipped with a 455 cubic inch engine, very big V8 engine, 7.5 liters. Now I can go out and spec out a Ford Mustang with, I can buy a five liter V8 or I can, uh, I can spec out a, a smaller 2.3 liter turbo charge um, inline four cylinder engine, which has approximately a third of the displacement of the, uh, of the engine in the Pontiac Firebird. If I took these to the racetrack and lined them up for a quarter mile race, right? How fast, you, which one would win? In this case, if I lined these two cars up and they were bone stock in the quarter mile, they would actually have the same performance. The, the turbocharged four liter uh, Ford Mustang would actually get off a little bit quicker off the line. The zero to 60 times are, are, would be a little bit faster, but the quarter mile time is exactly the same as the 1971 Firebird. So a lot of that has to do with the materials that are used in modern um, cars. Instead of the 1971 Pontiac Firebird with a cast iron engine block, um, carbureted engine, very thick gauge steel body panels. In the Ford Mustang, we have very thin, high strength, high uh, uh, steel body panels, thinner gauge steel, lighter weight, um, 
aluminum engine block, lighter weight, electronic fuel injection, more performance, right? And in doing that, not only can we achieve the same performance, we also get a significant benefit in fuel economy, right? Back in 1971, fuel was very cheap. Fuel was a lot cheaper than water. Basically a gallon of gas back in 1971 costs about 25, 30 cents per gallon. In 2019, uh, or probably 2016, gas prices were pretty high. Gas prices were about four or $5 per gallon. Um, Recently, gas prices have also started to tick up. We're paying more than $3 per gallon. So fuel economy is important now, right? So that has motivated automate, automakers to, to use better materials, more advanced materials to enable their design. So not only has this percolated through the, the conventional you know, um, uh, automotive industry for uh, combustion engines, this is also Materials and processes have also contributed significantly to the uh, electrification of automobiles, right? So some people think Tesla made the first electric car. That's, that's not true. General Motors actually made the, the first electric car. They created this EV1 electric car back in the, the early 1990s as a proof of concept. So back then they created this vehicle they did not have the advanced lithium ion batteries back in the day. So they put lead acid batteries in this vehicle, right? If anybody's ever changed the battery in their car, they, they realize that, you know, a battery, car battery that's yay big weighs about 40 or 50 pounds, pretty darn heavy, right? So because they used these lead acid batteries, um, wired them up to a three phase AC induction motor the range was very, very limited. This was a pretty heavy, this was a small car, but it was pretty darn heavy. And most of this weight was due to the lead acid batteries. The range was extremely limited. So it wasn't until we had better batteries that we could really popularize and, and commercialize these electric cars, right? So now on the Tesla website, I can, I can spec out a, a Tesla Model S with some lithium ion batteries. Even though they're lithium, they're they're pretty heavy, and but I can get a 400 plus mile range out of these cars due to the advances in batteries. The motor, the electric motor technology is is basically the same. They're both three phase AC induction motors, but it's the batteries that enable these 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 Tesla cars to to attain the performance and the range uh, requirements. Right, so materials have, have made a, a significant difference. Right, let's also talk about the Tesla Cybertruck. The Tesla Cybertruck is, is the new truck that, that uh, Elon's um, putting out in the next year or two. There's a lot of innovative materials that are used in the design of, of this uh, uh, truck, right? The, the windshield and the glass, they, they, they said it's armor glass. It's not actually glass, it's actually a ceramic material. Um, it, because it's a ceramic material, um, it has a much higher strength, a much higher toughness than, than typical auto glass. So with using a very thick gauge stainless steel, instead of having a typical frame on body, as you would uh, for a typical truck, they basically made the, the shell of the truck a, a rigid body so that it, 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 it's a load bearing structure. So they claim that the truck is bulletproof. Well, it's bulletproof because the, the uh, stainless steel body panels are about two and a half to three times thicker than that, the sheet metal that's used in a typical passenger car, right? So, so that's why it's bulletproof. It's not bulletproof because it's any uh, type of special material. It's bulletproof because it's a lot thicker um, than, than typical materials. So for the, the difference between a ceramic and a glass is due to the crystal structure and the arrangement of the atoms in the material. So for the, the crystalline armor glass, it's aluminum, oxygen, and nitrogen atoms, but they're all arranged in a, a, a um, repeating unit cell, a crystalline lattice. Whereas amorphous glass, 
is basically just a arrangement of disordered atoms within the material structure. Okay, so another example by which you know materials can enable design um, is an example for of Uber Elevate. Now we've all taken, or most of you have taken Uber or ordered food from Uber Eats. Uber is also is not a a a, um, a delivery service or a, a car service. It's actually a technology company. So Uber believes that the the next generation of delivery and personal mobility is going to be Uber Elevate. So Uber Elevate is basically a series of these very large um, drones that move people and things from one place to another in very densely populated metropolitan areas. So if you ever operated a drone, right? You know that drones can basically fly for about 20 minutes before they run out of juice and then they, they have to come back. But the, the larger the drone, the more energy it uses, right? So Uber Elevate is basically an electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicle that can be used to transport people and things from one place to another. So this is the concept for Uber Elevate. So what's preventing this concept from being realized? It sounds impossible, right? But what's preventing this concept from being realized is the battery materials, the types of, of batteries that this type of design requires. So if you look at current battery technologies, right? Lithium ion batteries are, are basically state of the art. But lithium ion batteries are not all lithium. There's some lithium in there, but there's a lot of nickel cobalt oxide on one side and, and graphite or carbon on the other side. So the energy density and the uh, watt hours per kilogram is not optimal. To realize this vision of this Uber Elevate concept, we need not only higher energy density batteries, but lighter batteries as well. So we need solid state lithium batteries or lithium air batteries that have um, watt hours per liter or watt hours per kilogram that are way out, out here in the upper right hand side of this chart. So until we are able to, to create these novel battery chemistries that have these much higher energy densities and energy outputs, we can't realize this concept of, of Uber Elevate. So there's always a demand for, for newer materials, better materials that are out there, right? Another example is the cell phone. So I think we, as, as uh, IIT students, we all realize one of our distinguished alums, uh, Marvin Cooper is the actual inventor of the cell phone. So he invented the cell phone in, in 1973 and we've come a long, long way since then. Right. So this is just a, a cell phone or what they call a brick phone. Um, this first smartphone was not the iPhone. It was actually the Simon phone that was uh, uh, um, created back in 1992. So this smartphone had a nickel cadmium battery. It did not have any type of fancy you know, organic LED screen. It had a monochrome screen. It had one megabyte of memory. It weighed a pound and a half, and it had very, very limited data connectivity. So that was the first smartphone back in 1992. So in the span of 30 years, we've come from this type of smartphone to this type of smartphone, right? The, the, there are foldable smartphones on the market now, right? You have these gigantic screens. The screens themselves are, are made out of organic LEDs, capacitive touch screens. Um, advances in uh, microelectronics and semiconducting materials have enabled significant advances in memory. Instead of one megabyte of memory, we can now squeeze in 12 gigabytes of memory into a smartphone like this. This phone back from 1992 had very, very limited uh, computing power, it, it weighed 18 ounces with the much, battery, much better battery technologies that we have. 
we can greatly reduce the mass of this phone. It weighs about nine ounces. It has 5G connectivity. So there have been significant advances in materials that have realized this. So foldable phones haven't really been, been uh, uh, very much widespread because of this one particular challenge. The screens themselves are somewhat susceptible to, to scratching because to get the foldable nature of these phones, they've been using basically laminated uh, polymers. They don't have the, the hardness or the scratch resistance, but that's soon changing because people are working on things like glass that is bendable. So this is uh, um, what people refer to as willow glass. Uh, I think it's a Dow Corning product. This is a very, very thin layer of glass and into the surface of this glass, they've impregnated ions to induce a very, very large compressive uh, uh, residual stress. By doing that, they can um, make the, the glass much more tolerable or much more um, damage tolerant and able to accommodate the large elastic strains when you bend and, and try to fold these types of structures. So again, this is another example by which materials has really contributed to advancing the state of the technology and, and really making this um, innovation possible. Um, the automotive industry has always embraced the use of new materials. So for the, this is the, the prior generation Corvette. This is the C7 Corvette. This frame is made out of mostly aluminum. There's actually some magnesium in here as well. This frame weighs about 400 pounds, 450 pounds. Two men can, can basically lift up this, uh, this frame. If this were steel, it would basically weigh about 1,000 pounds. There's no way two men can, can lift it up, right? Reducing weight, adding a bigger engine that makes the car go faster, better performance, right? Aluminum engine blocks. Uh, aluminum engine blocks have also greatly cut down the weight of automobiles. This V6 engine block from, from Ford, I think this weighs about 75, 80 pounds. If this were cast iron, it would weigh two to 300 pounds. Significant weight reductions due to the use of materials. But on the uh, um, con side of thing, because we're using aluminum, aluminum melts at relatively low temperatures. So if you were ever in a car fire, you should need to get out of the car if you're in an aluminum car because aluminum will basically melt and turn into a puddle of aluminum. This used to be a very nice Jaguar F-type car, a lot of aluminum body panels, aluminum engine block. So this is after a fire. Um, the, the white stuff that you see on the ground, there's some of the fire extinguishing foam in there, but it's also basically a, a puddle of the molten aluminum. Um, the Tesla Model S, there's, it's basically an aluminum frame that will also melt if it were to ever um, catch on fire. Um, okay, so I think I'm running a little bit short on time. So I'm just gonna skip ahead a little bit and talk just a little bit about, um, we, so we talked a lot about materials, processing, of materials is equally important. So engineers, when they design products or they design structures, their focus is on properties. They don't really care how you get those properties, but they need materials to have specific properties that meet their design requirements. So what a materials scientist and engineer does is they take the, the, the required property, the required set of properties, and then they figure out what type of material, what composition of material combined with the processing and the microstructure that will, at the end of the day, yield the properties that they want, right? So we can take steel, for example, depending on how you process the steel, the steel can be relatively soft and malleable, or it can be very hard and brittle, right? So that knowledge of the composition processing 
microstructure relationship and how it fits in with determining properties is what material scientists and engineers do, right? So an example of this is basically if I were to, you know, go out and purchase a, a crescent wrench, I could go to Dollar Tree and buy a crescent wrench for a dollar. Or I can go buy a crescent wrench from the Snap-on Tools truck. The Dollar Tree crescent wrench costs a dollar. The Snap-on Tools crescent wrench costs about $100. What's the difference? They're both made out of metal, right? They both look like crescent wrenches. They both operate as crescent wrenches. But the difference is the quality of the material and the method by which these crescent wrenches were processed. The Dollar Tree crescent wrench is probably made out of a very low grade uh, steel. It's probably not very strong. It's probably gonna break after you use it two or three times. The Snap-on Tools crescent wrench is probably made out of a very, very high strength steel alloy it's going to be very durable it's it, it's going to basically never fail right so you're you're paying for that quality so this type of analogy is basically uh can also be applied for um uh, uh food right if i'm hungry i can go to mcdonald's buy a double cheeseburger for a dollar 69 right meat bread cheese or I can go to Las Vegas and to the floor restaurant and buy a $5,000 cheeseburger. This will also fill me up, right? What's the difference between a McDonald's cheeseburger and a cheeseburger from Flora? Well, the quality of the materials, right? So beef in McDonald's hamburger probably comes from a cow, right? A generic cow. Beef from the burger for the floor restaurant probably is probably Kobe beef from Japan. It also has truffles and it probably has, you know, uh, um, uh, organic foie gras. So the, the quality of the material and how it's processed also contributes to the, the, the end performance and structure of the material. So I know that there's been a lot of recent uh, um, uh, high profile talks and, and uh, um, technological developments around additive manufacturing. Additive manufacturing gives you the freedom to make any shape that you want, right? But if you use additive manufacturing and process a, a product out of, let's say, titanium, the properties of that additively manufactured titanium structure are going to be very different than that of a cast titanium structure or a forged titanium structure. So that's the knowledge that material scientists and engineers have. The ability to understand how processing affects the, the, the underlying structure and how the underlying structure relates to the, the properties and performance of the material. So um, with that, uh, I guess I'll end there with, with the summary. Um, so, Hopefully this talk kind of clarified a little bit of uh, what material scientists do. I like to say that material scientists and engineers help make the impossible possible, right? A lot of times materials are considered to be either design limiting, right? If it's design limiting, then we need to figure out a better material that will enable that design to become realized. So hopefully through this talk, I, I you know, Everybody realizes that there's going to be a continual, continuing demand for new materials and new materials technologies, not only for structural materials, but also for functional materials, better magnetic, optical, uh, electronic materials, um, flexible electronics are, are, are now in vogue, um, quantum computing, quantum computers that use qubits, those require very, very special materials. Um, that are that are coming online. Um, the, there's going to be advances in structural materials, materials that don't corrode, materials that can be used in extreme environments, um, et cetera. Hybrid materials, materials that not only are functional in nature, but also have uh, other attributes as well, right? So right now, 
if they're making you know these these electric vehicles, electric cars and trucks, the batteries basically add a significant amount of weight to the vehicle because the batteries are are separate. But what if you can make a battery material that also could be used as a structural material, a battery that could be integrated into the 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 frame or the shell of the vehicle, right? So that would be a hybrid material. So in addition to the requirement for new materials, we also need to understand processes and how processes affect uh, the material attributes. So with that, um, I'd be happy to uh, take any questions.